Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It's the 10th of July. Hopefully you had a nice 4th of July weekend if you live in the United States. As always, a like and subscribe is appreciated. And also as always, I have the chapters down below so you can jump to a particular update. And there are a number of updates this week across a whole range of different topic areas. New videos this week, I created a video about the Logic App hosting options. There's different ways I can run that serverless offering. Originally I was gonna create a Logic Apps for Everyone video, but as I started to dive into it, it made sense to cover the hosting options first. And then I wanted to go back and create a deep dive into using remediation with Azure Policy as I'm deploying a resource, maybe changing aspects of it with modify effects, or even doing a deploy if not exist to deploy other types of resource based on a resource I'm deploying or modifying. So I went into detail about how that works, how the identities work. On to the new features. So we have this new NVADS A10 V5 has gone into GA. Now this is powered by the NVIDIA A10 Tensor Core based GPUs. It's using the AMD Epic processors and what's interesting about this particular series is rather than having to pay for a complete GPU, I can pay for partial GPUs. So if we actually go and look at the SKUs available, what we can see with this series is I can get a certain partition of a GPU. For example, I can get, hey, a sixth of the GPU, a third, half, and then obviously complete offerings. And with those, we also get the different amounts of virtual CPUs, uh, different amounts of memory, et cetera. So these are super useful for where I have those accelerated graphic type applications, maybe virtual desktops where I want that capability as well. So those are now GA. Moving on. So Windows 365, remember that desktop as a service offering, where just on a per user basis, I get a dedicated desktop for me. Well, now it supports nested virtualization. So this is the ability to run a hypervisor on an Azure virtual machine, which itself runs on a hypervisor. Now this is super useful in a number of ways. Sure, I can just run Hyper-V so I can now run VMs, inside my Windows 365 based virtual machine. But it also means I can now use things like Windows Subsystem for Linux. I can use Windows Subsystem for Android. So I get those capabilities now, I get that complete sandbox set of capabilities on my Windows 60, 365 machine. Also now new file transfer capabilities. I can easily transfer files from my local machine to my cloud PC just via an upload icon. And to transfer down, I download, I can just, hey, copy files to the downloads folder on my cloud PC, and they'll be copied to my downloads folder on my local machine. So very easy now to transfer files. Smart tiering is now available for the Vault Archive tier for virtual machine backup. So this can be both for regular virtual machines, but also for those SQL and SAP HANA in Azure VMs. So the archive tier is super useful because it's cheaper, but any incremental snapshot becomes a full snapshot. It's the entire content. So you wanna make sure those archive copies are completely independent of any others. But because it's much cheaper, that conversion to a full, hey, that, that still makes sense. So what's happening now is we have this smart tiering capability. What that's gonna do is either ones that are eligible or recommended, I can pick which I want for virtual machines, can automatically be tiered off to that archive tier. Now, there are some requirements around this. I need at least six months retention left. And then if it's a VM, it has to have already been in the standard vault for three months or for SAP and SQL at least 45 days. So that, hey, is now available in preview. Ephemeral OS disks for confidential VMs. I've talked about this already. I guess they've made some change to this. Obviously, ephemeral OS disks use the host that the VM runs on local disk space. This could be temp space for the VM or caching space for the virtual machine. 
Now, ordinarily, our OS disk is using durable storage. It's based on Azure storage, so there's three copies, and it's a managed disk typically. Well, ephemeral OS disks use that local space, so it's essentially free. I'm not paying for a managed disk. It's also very, very low latency, but it's not durable. If I shut down the provision, the VM, if there's some hardware failure, I lose that content. But for stateless workloads, who cares? That, that might be fine. So now even for the confidential VMs, either fully encrypted, the whole VM with the AMD, or I'm using the enclaves with the Intel based, I can now still use that ephemeral OS disk. I can now enable JBoss EAP. So obviously JBoss EAP is the enterprise um, application platform, really for Java applications, those Java enterprise edition applications, J2E, running on the Azure Red Hat OpenShift offering. So the Red Hat OpenShift provides that OpenShift cluster in a fully managed capability. It's really Kubernetes underneath, but with a lot of added value features. And what this JBoss EAP on the Azure Red Hat OpenShift is really a set of guidance on the configuration of a number of the different aspects of both those solutions. Now, obviously, JBoss EAP is already available on Azure App Service and VMs and VM scale sets, but this is now an additional way I can get that JBoss. Then Azure Functions now have a retry policy when I'm using Event Hub and Timer Triggers. So basically now if there's a failure, well, it will retry up to a certain number of retries I specify. So basically this retry policy will get evaluated whenever there is some timer or event hub based trigger. And hey, if there's an uncalled exception, it's gonna get considered a failure and can then retry. On the storage side, so Azure Archive tier is now available in South Africa North. So this is for my blob. Normally we have the hot and the cool tier. These are always available. Um, cool, I pay less for the capacity, but more for the transactions against it. Useful if I need immediate access, but I'm less likely and less often interacting with it. Then we have Archive, which is much, much cheaper, but is not immediately available. I have to rehydrate it into cool or hot to actually interact and there's a delay to do that. Well, now that archive is available in South Africa North. On the database side, Postgres SQL Hyperscale, remember Hyperscale is using that Citus extension to Postgres, so I can get huge scale, huge capacity by sharding the data over distributed tables. Well, now there's additional minor version supported, 11.16, 12.11, 13.7, and 14.3. I can now use with my hyperscale. Miscellaneous, so Azure AD Connect now has group write back in GA. So normally when I have Active Directory and Azure Active Directory, AD is always the source of truth. Very few things get written back from Azure AD to AD. Well, now those cloud groups that I create in Azure AD, I can actually synchronize them back to my Active Directory. I specify a particular organizational unit I want them to get created into. If it's a Microsoft 365 group, it can be written back as a distribution group, a security group, a mail-enabled security group. An Azure AD security group will get written back as a security group. Um, they're all universal groups they get written back as but realize these are now considered cloud source of authority for that group. So if I then made a change to the group locally in AD, well, the next sync cycle, it will get overridden with whatever is in Azure AD. But hey, it's in GA, I can go to my Azure AD Connect configuration and now turn on that group right back, set the OU I want it to write back to, and hey, there you go. User assigned. Managed service identity is now available for the Azure Monitor agent. Remember, the Azure Monitor agent is the replacement for the old log analytics agent. That could obviously be the OMS, the MMA, also Telegraph, also the diagnostics extension. The AMA is all based around those data collection rules I define, which then control everything the AMA gets. Up until this point, I had to use a system assigned managed service identity, which could generate a lot of churn in my Azure AD as it's maybe creating and deleting these. Well, now 
I can use that user assigned where it's a separate life cycle. I can set the permissions. And now I can use this for a larger scale deployment, larger scale overall authentication of that agent to the log analytics workspace. I can use Azure Policy to actually configure this. And um, from using Azure Arc today, it's still using the system assigned. And speaking of this, there are actually now some migration tools when I want to move from that log analytics agent, be it the MMA or OMS, to the Azure Monitor agent. Now remember, the old log analytics agent took its configuration from configurations on the workspace. That's different from these new data collection rules. And so there are a number of tools available to me. And what these tools are going to do is a number of things. So firstly, there's this DCR generator. <clears throat> this will go and look at legacy agent configurations and generate those data collection rules. So, hey, I get a consistent set of data. There's also this AMA migration helper. So this is a workbook. And what it's going to do is enable me to track, hey, what needs migrating, and then actually tracking the progress of my migrations. So it's going to really help me with that all up migration set of work. So those are available in preview to help me start thinking about, okay, I want to get off the log analytics agent and move to the Azure Monitor agent. Now realize today there are still many things that use a log analytics agent. For example, insights, a dependency agent, but over time expect all of those to move to the AMA. But depending on what I need and what I'm using, I could start thinking about that migration. Container Insights is now available for AKS clusters that are running Windows Server uh, 2022. So obviously Container Insights is that curated set of information on, hey, my AKS environment, on the pods, the nodes, all of that, really makes it easy to see what is going on. Today that's using Log Analytics Agent, but over time, again, that also will move to the AMA. App Insights had a number of updates. A big one was the idea of a standard test. We're used to the URL ping test, just, hey, can I get to this thing? Well, now we have the idea of a standard test. And a standard test is a richer configuration that not only checks things like, well, is the certificate valid to that endpoint, but can also do a more proactive check to say, well, is it going to expire? And give me an alert to say, hey, the certificate is going to expire based on some threshold that I can configure. There's also more advanced tests. I can deploy it up to 16 different locations. There is a cost associated, but I now do have this additional standard test in preview. And also I can use Azure AD authentication. Again, I've talked about this before, but now when I think about the credentials used to go and communicate to my App Insights resource from wherever the application is, well, now I can use a managed identity. It could be a service principle, but generally managed identity is a better option, and I could completely turn off any kind of local authentication at all. And then entry permissions management has gone GA. So entry is that new family of solutions around identity. Hey, we think of Azure AD, we think of the decentralized identity, and what was formerly known as CloudNox, which is now this entry permissions management. So entry permissions management is all about the idea that, hey, I have these multiple platforms, all these different clouds, Azure, AWS, GCP. And over time, both human and non-human identities tend to get these additional permissions added. Hey, I've done this new role, I get a new permission. Oh, I do a new role, I get another permission, but they don't take this one back. So you get this permission creep, and also which permissions am I using? And maybe I also need privileges on demand. So this entry permissions management is all about that, helping me see permissions creep, helping me see which permissions are actually being used, help me see which resources are being used, help me have that on demand set of permissions across all those different clouds. Who has high risk privileges? Who is at risk? So this is now GA, it's a per resource per year license. And that was it. So as always, I hope this is useful. 
As always, take care and I'll see you at the next video.